my bag. Okay, folks. Um, I guess we are about to start. Um, still people joining, uh, I guess. At least some of them. We have our final <laughs> preparement here in Glasgow at the at the venue. Um, together with me, together with me are the representatives or other delegates of the WBA. Um, Christian Rakos here and uh, Barajvai Kumamuru here, and also uh, Remigius Lapinskas. Um, and good day from us, uh, from the COP26 uh, meeting. Um, we are very happy to have this uh, chance to have this webinar today as the global bioenergy role or the role of, role of bioenergy in global uh, sphere is debated, not, not directly, but uh, the, the kind of outlines of that. Um, but I will give the floor for Varashvai um, Kumamuru from uh, World Bioenergy Association to uh, start moderate this and um, and and for let you to know uh, we will record this uh, meeting and and it will be uh, shared afterwards uh, uh, on our web web uh, page. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes, for the for the start and for the opportunity. Um, so I'm uh, pleased to see there's quite a few people joining in. Uh, we are pleased to join kind of virtually from Glasgow. I guess you see the globe there. Uh, we've been here for a couple of days uh, advocating for bioenergy at, uh, at the COP26, uh, which is one of our uh, immediate uh, priorities as well. So I'm glad to welcome uh, in the role of my in the role of moderator to everyone for this uh, webinar on the global role of bioenergy in the coming decades to combat uh, climate change. Uh, so the uh, we will start directly uh, first uh, with the uh, presentations or inputs from uh, an expert group of uh, panelists that we've uh, put together along with the Bioenergy Association of uh, Finland. So without further ado, I'll uh, like to invite uh, Dr. Ika Hanula from the International Energy Agency. Uh, who's going to talk about the role of bioenergy in the clean energy transitions. And the IE has been doing quite an excellent work, especially with this um, 1.5 scenario uh, pathways, and we are uh, excited to hear what would be the role of bioenergy in that. Uh, so Dr. Ika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to um, share some reflections on this topic from the International Energy Agency. Next, please. So we are living in unprecedented times. The pandemic is still with us. It has had a huge impact on the society, but also on the global energy system and including bioenergy, especially actually element of more for bioenergy than than other renewables. However, there are four grounds of optimism. I would say there are a number of uh, net zero pledges coming from different and important countries. I think more than 50 countries after the Paris Agreement have now made a net zero pledge, either for 2050 or 2060 or 2070. Most recently, India in the COP26 in Glasgow. Uh, new emission cuts have been announced uh, by the US and the EU this year. We are witnessing the largest stimulus packages in economic history, part of which will go to clean energy. And then from Glasgow, we heard last week also about the global methane pledge. More than 100 countries want to limit or pledge to limit methane emissions by 30 percent until uh, by 2030. And because methane is such an aggressive greenhouse gas, this is uh, in impact. This is as big as um, um, the whole global transport system. So it's a very big news. Um, next, please. A few weeks before the COP, the IEA launched its uh, flagship publication, the World Energy Outlook, where the IEA introduces new scenarios. Uh, the one of uh, one of them is the stated policy scenario, which follows what would happen and what is the trajectory we are in, uh, considering all the clean energy targets that are put into legislation, put into uh, effect. 
Then we introduce the announced pledges scenario, which is uh, includes all the pledges that have been announced but not yet implemented. This includes various net zero emissions uh, uh, pledges, and this is now updated after COP26. This one, uh, the one below here, includes already. Um, the methane pledge and the India uh, net zero pledge we heard last week. And then there is the net zero by 2050, which is the IEA, um, which IEA roadmap that IEA uh, launched in May this year. So how do they relate to temperature increase? So the net zero is uh, consistent with limiting the global temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The stated policies is looking something 2.6 degrees, but now for the first time, the announced pledges, including the Glasgow pledges, is looking for below two degrees Celsius. So we calculated that one point they are looking for 1.8 degrees of warming by end of this century. OK, next, please. However, the pledges, pledges and target are not enough by themselves. They need to be converted to actual and real uh, CO2 reductions. And when we look at this uh, graph here, which is the change in global CO2 emissions by fuel for the last three decades, we see that we have yet to witness the kind of CO2 emissions to start to go on a permanent decline. In fact, the IEA now predicts that uh, <clears throat> CO2 emissions are set to increase by nearly 5% this year as demand for coal, oil and gas rebound with the economy. Next. So the net zero roadmap is kind of the kind of idea behind it that the kind of ambitious goals that go all the way to 2050 or 60 or 70, uh, how, what, what, how, what should we do now so that we know that we are on track with that long long term target? Next, please. So the roadmap includes more than 400 different policy um, interventions that can be considered by policymakers and milestones that should be achieved so that we know that we are on track with the long term target of becoming net zero. I here I uh, you can see that it has this kind of sectoral approach. Electricity should go to net zero already globally by 2040. This is basically A, because most of the existing technologies in the marketplace are applicable to electricity generation. And secondly, because the other sectors are going to rely heavily on electrification. So the electric, there's a need to quickly decarbonize the electricity so that the new uses for electricity will then actually uh, also reduce emissions. Uh, for biofuels I have and bioenergy, I have uh, highlighted here one of the main targets, which is that 50% of fuels used in aviation are sustainable globally in 2040 to be on track with the net zero. In itself, already a, a, a formidable goal. Next, please. So the roadmap is underpinned by two pillars. One of them is that we should deploy this uh, decade all low carbon technologies that are avail available in the market. And while at the same time, uh, we should massively uh, increase uh, funding for energy, clean energy R&D and demonstrations. So that during this decade, we kind of commercialize those technologies that will then take the main seat in reducing emissions in the 30s and in the 40s. So that technologies that are today still under development will are responsible for reducing 50% of emissions between 2030, between now and 2050. So that's kind of very important that we will be able to kind of commercialize them this decade so that they are available in the 30s and in the 40s. Next, please. So now looking more closely, bioenergy, it plays a major role in the net zero roadmap and in various forms. In solid form, it contributes to decarbonizing electricity sector, the industry sector and buildings. And then in the form of liquid fuels and biogases, it will contribute to transport. Uh, the use of modern transport, modern bioenergy increases from currently from 25 exajoules to 100 exajoules by 2050 and becomes uh, the second largest source of energy supply, second only to solar in 2050. Next, please. So, and within the bioenergy sphere, 
biofuels are representing something like 30 percent and especially the advanced biofuels are necessary for reaching net zero. So in gaseous fuels we see a huge increase in the uh, use of biomethane and in liquid biofuels advanced uh, fuels like biodiesel and biokerosene expand rapidly. So from less than 1% of total biofuel supply in 2020 to almost 45% in 2030 and then 90% in uh, 2050. And increasingly, as you can see from the kind of shaded part of the bar, and the bars here, increasingly with CCUS, so carbon capture and utilization, or carbon capture and storage, either to convert that extra carbon from processing to more fuels, or then if geology allows storing it to provide negative emissions. Next. So the negative emission part is really important part of the story of bioenergy use in net zero. Um, the net zero roadmap includes some 7.6 gigatons of CO2 captured in 2050, most of that will come from fossil fuels, especially in industrial emissions, but about a quarter of 2.4 gigatons is captured through bioenergy or directly from the air, of which majority 1.9 gigatons is stored and a small part is utilized for chemicals and fuels. Next, please. So to conclude, um, so reaching net zero is a critical and formidable goal and it requires fundamental change in the way we produce energy, you, uh, transport and, and use it. Next. Next, please. Uh, this was the last one. All right, uh, I had it was supposed to come. Okay, I can. Uh, so the pathway to net zero, it hinges on immediate and massive deployment of all available clean and efficient energy technologies today, while at the same time boosting clean energy innovation to prepare for the, uh, the technologies of the next decade. Low emission fuels, be they in the form of liquid fuels, in the form of biomethane or hydrogen based fuels, the, in the roadmap they mostly decarbonize sectors where direct electrification is challenging. And when the energy mix in, in general, uh, especially in, in, in power systems, becomes dominated more and more by renewables like wind and solar, bioenergy features prominently there. Not so much in terms of energy contribution, only 5% of total energy, but it's important how it produces it, because it produces it in a, in a flexible way, balancing the variation in, in solar and wind. In industry and transport, bioenergy is increasingly used in connection with CCUS. So we need urgent, strong and credible policy actions from governments in a way that is underpinned by much greater international cooperation. And this is needed to attract investment at scale and foster the required innovation for the technologies of tomorrow. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Ekala, for the, for the um, excellent overview uh on on the role of bioenergy and what's expected uh, from the sector uh in in meeting the challenge for 1.5 uh degree uh i mean it's an unprecedented challenge what what you've uh, mentioned and in the concluding remarks as well and and it's sometimes surprising that when you say bioenergy will account for 20 percent of the total energy supply by 2050 and second largest after solar uh, but when we hear, keep hearing these discussions around COP26, sometimes you don't hear bioenergy as much as, as it has to. And I think one, just a quick follow up question I, uh, would be that uh, from industry association perspective and from the industry, we feel quite uh, happy uh, that, that uh, bioenergy has uh, to play an important role. Uh, that's what IEA has been saying, and we've been using that quite a bit in the advocacy work that we are doing. But do you have any uh, kind of responses or discussions with policymakers or, or after the publication of this report? What has been their perception? Do they feel that bioenergy could do a lot more or is it too much? Uh, what has been your uh, uh, perception from discussions with policymakers post uh, this uh, publication of this report? Well, bioenergy is really kind of uh, because it's so regional, so it plays a very different uh, role in different parts of the world. 
so it depends very much who you are talking with. Uh, also, the whether you're talking about advanced uh, economies or emerging economies, it's a totally different story. Uh, but in general, I think uh, bioenergy kind of is a little bit um, not so visible because it's contributing in so many ways. So it's not only energy, but it's doing uh, work on industry, on transport, in heat. So basically just I, I think uh, the IEA Netzero roadmap actually is not uh, very biomass heavy. So it has much less biomass from than uh, uh, the IPCC latest scenarios. The median um, bioenergy use in IPCC scenarios is uh, 200 exajoules and the IEA net zero is only 100. So it's quite low in that respect, but still it requires four times the use of bioenergy in 2050 than today. So um, um, I, I think it's uh, the problem with the discussion is mostly because bioenergy can do so many things and how should you then use it? And the secondly is that like it's very regional and depends on where you are in terms of your economic development. Seems that we have lost Glasgow, but I'm thinking <laughs> whether the next speaker on the program should proceed in the meanwhile, as we have limited time. I wanted to kind of uh, link uh, to what uh, the previous speaker was saying, and he said it's necessary to start introducing renewable energy technology as soon as possible. And the good thing about bioenergy is that this a lot of very, very good technology already available. And just in the last two or three years, we've seen a new generation of boilers coming up, for example, that have virtually zero emissions. So below two milligrams of dust uh, using biomass, which is quite amazing achievement. And that uh, for any size between 10 kilowatts and, and three megawatts, for example, uh, we are seeing uh, Cogeneration technologies with gasification and engines uh, connected uh, in in the small uh, uh, power range that have not existed in the past. Um, we see new technologies for liquid and gaseous fuels um, based on bioenergy, um, and we see the emergence of uh, bioenergy carbon capture and storage in several really large projects both in the Scandinavian area and in Stockholm and Copenhagen, uh, as here in UK, uh, Drax is going to make a huge uh, uh, BEX project. So I think uh, it's very exciting and it is also encouraging to see that technology is, is moving, technology is available. We do not have to wait for it to be there. We can just start to deploy it. And I think that's my main message um please uh let's not talk only about research and development let's talk about deployment and let's start to do it right away thank you very much and i'll hand over to uh Paradoj. perfect thanks again thanks again christian uh just to give some uh perspective with the challenges that we face with wi-fi here there's about 10,000 people in the venue uh, we've just got notifications so that's a that's a bit of a challenge uh, to get good connection but anyway thanks christian for the for the overview uh, i don't have any questions uh, as of now i hope uh, there might be some questions later on from from the audience who's joining in uh, but i now uh, move on to our next uh, presenter that would be yari nimela who uh, is the director of uh, valmet technologies and uh, he's going to talk about technologies to give uh, cutting edge for transformation uh, so the floor is yours uh, yari Thank you. Thank you. So, you'll take the first slide. So, I'm working in the, in the energy sector and heading a technology, business technology unit, uh, boilers and, and new technologies. And into the new technology sector is belonging in gasification and pyrolysis and that kind of coming products. So, Coming from Valmet, and uh, Valmet is uh, the technology supplier to pulp and paper and energy sector. So me, our base is, uh, is, is actually the pulp and paper sector. So we are really, really the front runner in, in, in those kind of technologies. And uh, on energy sector, our, our products are, the, as I mentioned already, boilers and gasification plants, 
uh, different sizes for industrial solutions. Then we have emission control technologies, uh, which are developing and taking huge steps uh, to, to high, higher efficiencies. And then uh, automation is, is one of our, our let's say, uh, footprint also and, and uh, uh, growing all the time. And, and services, are, is, uh, so we are taking care of, of the services of our, our products. And I must say that the services will be in the future in big role because uh, uh, these uh, technologies, uh, economical lifetime will be much shorter in the future. I think nobody can anymore think about that coal-fired unit which will be built today has a lifetime of 25 years. It's the same with, with all the combustion systems so that the new technologies are coming all the time and, uh, and affecting changes uh, to the existing processes and systems. So the future will be very interesting in, in, in that sense. And uh, if you think about these renewable fuels, uh, we all know that uh, uh, these fossil-based fuels use will be dramatically reduced in, in the electricity production. Coal phase out in, in European Union is, is in full speed. We can see that uh, on, on the markets. And uh, the short term solution seems to be gas, solar and wind uh, will, will, will have uh, in the future much, much bigger role and uh, green hydrogen is, is, is coming. Uh, but if you think about the electricity, balance system, so the storage technology development is, is uh, heavily needed and uh, we know that uh, they are taking big steps and uh, different kind of solutions and, and are under development. And uh, the heat demands in uh, industrial sector, they are so huge that uh, uh, biomass has always a role in, in heat supplying and uh, combined heat and power solutions. It's hard to think about this, uh, that this uh, process uh, and chemical and pulp mills whatsoever are sometimes making the steam demand uh, based on, on electricity or, or, or hydrogen. So there's always uh, always place for biomass. And uh, it's a clean, affordable and secured source and, uh, and uh, it's at the same time uh, providing uh, the local employment opportunities and uh, let's say the variety of, of the biomass will increase uh, of course there are the forest uh, forest residues and but agro is coming on on the discussion and technologies are developing to that uh, directions and also let's say uh, these uh, other type of uh, products coming from the circular economy the products uh, side streams which cannot be any more circulated. Uh, there's only way to combust uh, those uh, with, with very, let's say, advanced uh, technologies. And of course, geothermal and CCS uh, technologies will be part of the solution as already already presented. And uh, there's uh, many charts made uh, about the future development of, of biomass uh, utilization. Of course, the biggest challenge for biomass utilization is is it a general uh, uh, bad feelings against the uh, combustion. So, so the combustion is, is not favor, favored, but we have to develop the combustion systems more, let's say, environmental friendly and uh, more acceptable. And uh, it has been estimated that actually the utilization of biomass will be three, four times higher uh, up to 2050 compared uh, to, to current uh, situation. If we think about the technologies in, in existing and uh, further developing is uh, there's fluidized bed boilers, uh, there's uh, excellent efficiency, flexibility, high reliability and, and suitability for different type of uh, biomass qualities. Gasification uh, is, is, uh, is a process where we can convert biomass uh, recycled materials and waste to in, in product gas and, and this gas can be burned uh, beside uh, other combustion uh, systems. In, in this transition period, for example, we can combine gasification, biomass gasification to, to coal fired unit to replace actually fossil fuels, fuel uh, utilization. Emission control technologies, as mentioned, I want to highlight this flue gas heat recovery. 
So we have technologies that we can take the, the last droplet of the heat from the flu, flu gases uh, to be utilized in district heating or, or process heating systems. And, uh, and the total efficiency of the heating plant will, will dramatically be higher. And uh, ongoing and future technologies, there was already mentioned this uh, uh, carbon capture and, and uh, our part of, of this story is actually this uh, uh, oxygen combustion system uh, to, to make our boilers uh, to operate in, in such a condition as uh, that this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 nitrogen, uh, sorry, sorry, carbon dioxide can can uh, directly emit it uh, from the flue gases uh, to, to such a format that, that those gas can be pumped actually uh, to the storage systems, whatever they are. Of course, the legislative, uh, legislative framework is needed and he was expected to take the first steps in, in this sector. And the circular economy is, is the other other area where we see that uh, gives also potential to, to connect it uh, to, to biomass utilization in, in co combustion systems. But that's not actually at, at the moment very much in favor, but uh, we see that uh, this is one, one anyway source of fuel source for the future heat production. And then there are coming products uh, where from uh, bioenergy. Uh, can be utilized more efficiently, like uh, gasification systems where you can actually uh, produce uh, the raw material for, for uh, to, to prepare liquid uh, fuels uh, with, with higher higher bio comp components and uh, so and the pyrolysis is actually pyrolysis is the one what we are putting a lot of effort uh, to to produce uh, let's say. Uh, bio components to be utilized uh, to be to be a source of, of air fuel and and, uh, and and also transportation fuel highly on, under development and uh, we have actually a big reference already on on this sector demo plant se sector so i see that uh, biomass is needed and uh, uh, it's, it has a so, certain big role in, in the future and uh, we are developing all the time uh, products uh, to, to better utilization of, of biomasses. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Uh, perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Jari, for the uh, for the overview. I mean, it shows the range of technology solutions available uh, for for utilizing bioenergy in a uh, for utilizing biomass in an efficient and, and, and sustainable way. Uh, and looking at uh, this range, it's, it's quite promising. And uh, I just had one follow up uh, uh, check was that uh, you did mention the legislative framework at the European Union, and there's a lot of developments right now, discussions right now surrounding bioenergy, uh, surrounding the RED2 and 3 and so on. But as a technology company, what has, what's your, uh, what's been your impression in, in these new legislative frameworks that are being developed towards 2030 and 2050? And if you have a chance, for example, when you sit with the policymakers, uh, I, for example, if you are here at the COP26 and, and you meet the policymakers, what would be kind of a message you would give, uh, which would give you a, the right signal to to make sure that this uh, transformation happens at the at the pace that is needed? Actually, the, the challenge is this, that uh, this co combustion possibilities will be limited. And uh, we see that actually we should utilize uh, uh, biomass as much as possible connected to, to other combustion systems, especially in this transition system. Uh, there are places where a small amount of biomass and big amount of fossil fuels available, but there should be possibility to utilize also the so, uh, small amounts of, of biomasses to be part of, of the future solution. And it seems that the legislation is now some kind of hindering this kind of uh, co-combustion system in systems and, and they are favoring a natural gas instead of that. That's that's something that I cannot understand. I think that's also something that we don't understand what happens, but it's a it's a challenge <laughs> and we have to work together, I guess, to to, to yes. inform better and to showcase uh, 
good examples of how, how bioenergy has improved so much in whether it's in terms of efficiency, whether it's in, in, in utilization. These are yeah. good examples and, and, and these has to be showcased uh, quite a lot and, and mm. we hope uh, yeah, we could do that better to, to inform the policy makers. Mm. Yes, because we have seen in Finland that uh, when there comes a, let's say, combustion process somewhere, okay, at first it seems that there, there is not available biomass available, but after a few years there will be. But when there is somebody to pay and burn biomass, uh, it will be it will be a part of, and, and it, it will make a business to the surrounding people to supply these uh, small amounts which are growing all the time. And uh, that kind of uh, processes we should uh, support also in, in other countries in, in Europe, not hindering Absolutely. these kind of processes. Absolutely, I completely agree. I think Dr. Ika pointed out uh, the amount of biomass we need is far less than what its sustainable potential is available. So it's mm -hmm. not a challenge of feet or it's not a challenge of technology. I think it's we know where the challenge is and we've got to work together to inform them better. So yes. uh, thanks again for, for, for uh, taking time to present uh, uh, a little bit on technologies. And I move next to our uh, last and final speaker. Uh, Ika Rasanan, who is the Vice President of uh, Neste, is going to give us an overview on renewable fuels for roads, air and sea. There's a lot of developments on aviation and maritime sector. Uh, hard to decarbonize, as they say. So, so we'll be glad to hear your uh, uh, your input in this discussion on how bioenergy is helping meet the challenges of decarbonization in, in such sectors as well. So I give you the, I give the floor to you. Thank you, and, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I will also share my screen from my computer. If you don't see it soon, please let me know. So um, my name is indeed uh, Ilkka Rasan, and I'm from Neste, another company hailing from Finland. Um, and we are a world leader in renewable fuels, in particular uh, renewable diesel, which is a high quality uh, biofuel. Um, also, we are very much into renewable aviation, uh, where we also are a market leader, although the market is very much a nascent one so far. Um, uh, I won't be talking about marine fuels much at all here, because that is even more nascent and e emerging. And for the sake of time, I will mainly cover road and, and um, uh, aviation sector. Um, but uh, let's start uh, with the problem that we're all aware, but it's just striking to think of the sheer volume that oil uh, has still in our energy systems, petroleum, crude oil from below the earth. We're consuming the black stuff to the tune of some 4.5 billion tons of oil equivalent per year. These are IEA figures. Yes, before the pandemic, but as was already mentioned there, the demand is rebounding. Let's hope it won't grow from this level, but even if it doesn't grow, it's a lot. And therefore we need all solutions to replace oil by other solutions. Uh, be it biomass or electrification or hydrogen or what is it, I don't know, but all of those solutions are certainly needed and they're needed fast. So then if we break uh, that big oil consumption um, a bit into smaller pieces, this looks at the statistics from the demand side, but uh, the numbers are approximately the same for transport, um, the demand for uh, oil in 2019 was that 2.6 billion tons when you count all the transport sectors together. Um, then if you look at the different segments here, the marine fuel demand is around 267 million tons and the jet fuel demand is 320 million tons and then the bulk of the transport fuel demand is in the road sector. Personal vehicles, buses, lorries, trucks, vans, and, and, and so forth. Now, if we look at how to replace or displace uh, 
crude oil from the equation, we do need to look at all of the solutions. Um, electric vehicles are of course taking off quite fast and that's all good um, as the energy generation, electricity generation is also decarbonizing. That's a good solution, especially first in the personal vehicles. So in 2020, it's estimated that there were, there were some 10 million electric vehicles on the roads globally. And that would correspond to approximately 6 million tons of oil consumption. So these 10 million electric vehicles would displace 6 million tons of uh, crude oil consumption. Figures are relatively large, but when you look it in, in the context of all that oil demand in transport, it's a tiny, tiny part of it. Then if you look at the global renewable fuel consumption, which is these days basically biofuels, then you will have power to X solutions at some point. But today, if you say renewable fuel, that's equivalent to biofuel. So that's the green area here on the left-hand corner of the picture. When you look at all the ethanol consumption in Brazil and US and all the biodiesel and ethanol and renewable diesel consumption in Europe and, and US and across the world, you come up to this kind of a figure, a little bit less than 100 million tons of oil is being displaced by biofuels use last year. So there's still a long way to go. Um, then looking at some projections until 2040, um, including on IEA World Energy Outlook and some other estimates, you know, maybe there will be 600 million electric vehicles on the roads in 20 years time. And that already then uh, has a material impact on displacing crude oil from uh, from transport, but it's still by far not enough. You will need uh, other solutions as, as well. Um, we have um, looked at the figures that um, McKinsey came up for World Economic Forum's report for aviation fuels, they tried to look at the feedstock availability for renewable fuel production in the future, in the 2040 timeframe. And they came up with that a bit more than a billion tons. Uh, and that would be then the green area on the left-hand side. So, you know, by 2040, EVs and renewable fuels could displace more than 50% of crude oil transportation, crude oil in transportation. If you then bring into the picture, which we very much also hope, reduction, just reduction in, in, in um, travel, um, more energy efficiency, you bring in hydrogen or other solutions. Um, we have a reason to be cautiously optimistic, but, to make that happen, of course, there needs to be enabling policy frameworks that recognize that all of these solutions are needed. We should avoid uh, any single solutions or betting on this or this technology or this and that. Currently, at least in here in Europe, there's very much thrust behind electric vehicles and hydrogen, and that's all good. They're needed, but they're not enough. And that should be understood hopefully soon. And with that, I would like to narrow down the scope of the analysis here from the global and 2040 perspective to um, uh, Europe and 2030 perspective. Um, here, uh, the slide shows um, the results of European Commission's own impact assessment that has underpinned their legislative proposals for the so-called Fit for 55 package that the European Commission presented in, in July. And in that impact assessment, they ran a series of scenarios um, which show clearly that liquid fuels will dominate uh, the transport sector in 2030. These are the middle, um, middle bar charts here. The red part here is the fossil oil products, and then you have smaller parts, biofuels um, growing their share there, a little bit of a, 
uh, natural gas, hopefully increasing amount, and then some hydrogen and electricity still having a, quite a small uh, share in 2030. Um, you don't hear too much about the role of liquid fuels in transport from the EU these days, but the analysis that they've made show the dominating role of, of these fuels still in the 2030 time frame. If you look at this from the vehicle fleet standpoint, um, the picture looks the same. Uh, you will have still a very dominant share of uh, internal combustion engines on our roads in, in 2030. If you look at the personal cars where electrification is picking up quite fast and where it has the fastest potential to penetrate still 75 percent of the personal car fleet in eu would be um, internal combustion engine based uh, light good vehicles or vans 80 percent and in um, all heavy duty vehicles um, or hybrids you would have uh, 85 percent um, of the vehicles running on internal combustion engines basically diesel in the 2030 time frame and if you then look also a bit longer term to 2050 still 35 to 40 percent of all heavy goods vehicles would be diesel or diesel hybrid so certainly liquid fuels will be part of the portfolio for a long time and therefore we need to focus a lot in the policy on how to decarbonize emissions uh, from liquid fuels used in internal combustion engines so um, lastly then on aviation um, this is a new frontier and certainly even harder to decarbonize um, again, looking at from uh, looking at it from the European perspective, the European Commission proposed this summer also to introduce a sustainable aviation fuel mandate or a blending obligation. In other words, for all flights uh, in the EU, um, sustainable aviation fuels being both sustainable biofuels and uh, power to X or power to liquid in this case solutions uh, with um, mandate mandated blending uh, percentages starting in 25 and growing there first slowly to 2030 and then quite fast uh, up to 63 percent in 2050 so clearly you has this in their minds as well and certainly the industry is ready to respond to that i will uh actually not talk about the marine sector as i am out of time and i wouldn't be able to tell too much about it it's a segment that neste is looking at and as many other companies are looking at and where there are also other alternatives like um, ammoniac methanol uh, gaseous fuels uh, many many solutions and in in that segment i'm sure many solutions will be needed as well so thank you very much for your attention thank you perfect thank you that was a quite an excellent uh, overview of the challenge that we face i always like the uh, i've been to a few uh, uh, presentations before from some of your representatives and uh, it's always nice to see those images where the share of the renewable fuel is so low uh, and it also shows the challenge that we have uh, in, in, in decarbonizing the whole whole uh, image. Uh, but I just had one follow up uh, point to make. I mean, you've talked about mandates, uh, 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 for example, for the aviation fuels. But of course, mandates are one thing. Uh, but the, the challenge is actually to meet those mandates. And when I when I look at the uh, the uh, the share of renewables in the transport sector, uh, Probably Sweden, Finland are one of the top countries who have actually done enough uh, to to meet the meet the decarbonization targets. For example, for 2020 of 10%, I think Sweden's at about 27-28%. Uh, uh, Finland's probably around the same uh, range in the higher 20s. 
uh, and most of it has been because of the uh, uh, availability of HVO in in the transport uh, in the transport sector, and that has been a very good success story. But uh, just looking at the challenge that we have and the mandates you see for the aviation sector, and also for example for the road sector, what are the uh, what do you think are uh, one or two good uh, policy frameworks, policy incentives which have helped? Uh, for example, the couple of Nordic countries to actually do a lot, and and what do you think uh, uh, is is lacking? Uh, uh, to, for example, for us to meet the, the targets uh, towards 2030 or towards 2050, what's something good and what's something bad you feel uh, which has helped the sector in, in, in road and, and uh, aviation, for example? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. I, I think um, long term, long term predictability is key. So investors can invest, they will have a certainly certainty of the market if the legislators legislate for um, blending obligations or and tax regimes that will be there for foreseeable future or at least for a long time so there's investment security and that has certainly helped um, in the nordics uh, it has helped in in california too by the way where the lcfs low carbon fuel standard program has been in place and has targets until 2030 and that is now driving quite a lot of investment in us and, and a lot of more supply for um, renewable diesel also known as hvo uh, so more supply is coming i i think the learning is that supply will follow demand and the demand needs to be created by legislation as renewable fuels unfortunately are more expensive than fossil fuels um, what is also important is uh, that you keep broad enough a pool of feedstocks that are available uh, for industry. Sustainability is key and has to be ensured, but we should not pick and choose this or that uh, feedstock only or this or this set of feedstock just because X, Y and Z, because it's not growing here or there are some concerns about sustainability, we have to tackle those sustainability concerns and do it seriously and then have a broad selection of uh, sustainable feedstock available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you've touched upon, touched upon quite a few points and it's, uh, it's critical that uh, anything that's decided is technology neutral, as you pointed out, uh, that we need a basket of solutions, not all eggs in one basket. Uh, uh, but bioenergy is versatile and it, it, it provides a variety of solutions uh, for, for helping decarbonize, as we saw, not just the transport sector, but also the heating sector and electricity, not just in the European Union, but around the world. And it's important for us uh, to, to showcase this. And Finland has been a very good example of how uh, bioenergy has been quite successful in, in that regard. Uh, but uh, so we are, uh, we don't seem to have any questions from the, uh, from the floor or from the, uh, uh, from the group who has joined uh, this webinar. So as we're just over time, uh, I would just like to wrap up uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, thanks again to Hannes and his team at the uh, at Bioenergy Association of Finland for putting the, putting this together and also inviting the World Bioenergy Association for, uh, for uh, moderating this and also contributing to this session. There's a lot of interesting developments happening at COP26, so uh, keep uh, tuned. And uh, we hope to see you all uh, again in uh, future events. And as pointed out, the, the session would be recorded and the event would be available on the home page. So again, I thank all the uh, panelists, Dr. Ikka, Christian, Yari, and Ikka uh, from Nestle for uh, being part of this. And uh, uh, have, a, have a nice day, have a nice evening, everyone. So goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.